Good afternoon. Um, welcome. Hello, everyone. For those of you who are returning to campus, welcome back. Great to see you. Um, those of you who are new, welcome. Um, and welcome to our community. As you may know, the opening convocation of the year is a tradition at Grinnell. And starting last year, um, it took on added significance as a moment when we announced the recipients of the Grinnell Prize, um, also known by the lengthy title of the Grinnell College Young Innovator for Social Justice Prize. It just rolls off the tongue. Um, either way, the prize honors individuals under the age of 40 who demonstrate leadership, creativity, commitment, and extraordinary accomplishment in affecting positive social change. So what do we mean by positive social change? Um, you know, for my generation, social justice uh, summons visions of civil rights marches and anti-war protests and the war on poverty. Um, and here at Grinnell, the phrase social justice has a particular resonance. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke here in the fall of 1967, the night before he headed to Birmingham um, to serve his 19th jail sentence for his role in the civil dis disobedience campaign for civil rights. The speech he gave in Darby Jim, entitled Remaining Awake Through Revolution, echoed ideas he had put forth earlier uh, during an imprisonment in Birmingham in 1963, where he wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. Here are a pair of quotes in which you might hear a common note. In the letter he wrote, quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, unquote. And then four years later here in Grinnell, he reiterated, no individual can live alone, no nation can live alone, we are interdependent. I don't think it was a coincidence that his Grinnell speech uh, was chosen to, to revisit the connections he saw between a just society and an interdependent one. One message was clear, we have an obligation to our neighbors. But Dr. King would remind us that we also have an obligation to expand the boundaries of our neighborhood. That is why he said to the Grinnell audience that they must not only be just, but no individual can live alone and no nation can live alone. For the students of today and your successors, the world is your neighborhood. Community service is a global service, service to a cause the cause of justice for all. The principle is deeply embedded in our history. Most of you know that Grinnell was founded by abolitionists. We we're also one of the first colleges in the country to admit women students. As the Civil War drew male students off to war in 1862, women actually outnumbered men on the college's campus, 21 to seven. Ah, the good old days of a truly small uh, residential liberal arts college. You will find uh, Grinnellians among the founders of the social gospel movement, the New Deal, and in fact, this year we celebrate the centennial of the graduation from Grinnell of Harry Hopkins, architect of the New Deal. Grinnellians led the resistance to McCarthyism and the war in Vietnam. They launched the modern computer revolution and led the fight for liberation and human rights in South Sudan. They helped organize the reconstruction of New Orleans and they teach in disadvantaged communities across the country. Um, there are even Grinnell graduates among the leaders of the animal rights movement. And this is not to even mention the many thousands of scholars and artists, activists, and business people who embody Grinnell's values by struggling to make the world a better place every day through their work and their philanthropy. So we all belong to this community, or maybe I should more accurately describe this community um, as a congregation um, with all the implications for the word um, when it comes to a communion of ideas and spirit and mutual commitment. And you don't have to be a congregationalist as our founders were, as I am not, uh, to proudly accept your role in this congregation. You do not have to believe in any deity. You have to believe in yourself and your obligation to those around you. That is our common faith. The Grinnell Prize is one way we have found to honor the tenets of that faith, now almost two centuries old. Of course, the other distinctive aspect of Grinnell is that our social justice values lead to our purpose as a learning community. You can hear the echoes of this in our motto, 
veritas et humanitas, truth and humanity. It signifies that we believe the education we provide will ultimately be evaluated in terms of your ability and drive to make the world a better place. So whether you become a professor or a painter or a doctor or a CEO or have a job that we don't even have a name for yet, you should always be recognizable as a Grinnellian by your analytic genius, your creativity, and your open-mindedness. But also, your strong ethical sense and your commitment to ensuring the well-being of all of those around you. We created the prize to make the world more aware of people we feel embody those principles, and we benefit from our relationship with the award winners. Our students help to run the symposium where they speak, they will take short courses taught by prize recipients. They, along with faculty and staff, have opportunities to intern with the winners' organizations around the world and interact one-on-one -on -one with these pioneers of social change. In other words, the prize has become a way of extending the Grinnell community through our core values. So, um, our prize selection committee. Um, this committee uh, really embodied the kind of commitment that we hope is illustrated in the work of these awardees. Our committee includes diverse faculty, staff, alumni, students, and trustees, as well as prominent leaders who are unaffiliated with Cornell. Before we announce the winners, I'd like to recognize the committee members for their efforts. Um, it would be, uh, I, 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 how many committee members do we have here today? Could you raise your hand? One, at least one, two, a few. I know others uh, could not make it. But each of you um, did an incredible job in applying your ta to your task uh, sensitivity, creativity, and passion, and we thank you for your hard work and dedication. So let me run through the prize members in the rear. Uh, George Drake, Grinnell alumnus and chair of this and last year's committee, professor of history and professor emeritus of the college. Rekha Basu, columnist for the Des Moines Register and a recipient of Grinnell's Honorary Doctorate, Humane Letters. Monica Chavez Silva, the college's Director of Community Engagement and Enhancement. Laura Ferguson, class of 90, a family practitioner in Grinnell and a, a vice chair of the Board of Trustees. Emily Westergaard Hamilton, class of 2002, and executive director of Des Moines' I Have a Dream Foundation. Uh, Emily was recently named a finalist um, of the Des Moines Register and Juice Magazine's Young Pro Professional of the Year Award. Uh, Suku Radia, CEO and President of Bankers Trust. Suku is active on numerous boards and charitable organizations. Gabe Schechter, a 2012 graduate who served as the Grinnell Student Body President, 2011-2012. Suzanne Siskel, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Asia Foundation and former Director of Social Justice Philanthropy at the Ford Foundation. The Honorable Marsha K. Ternus, former Chief Justice of the Iowa Supreme Court. Uh, Marsha was recently honored with the John F. Kennedy Profile and Courage Award for her leading role in advancing the cause of marriage equality. And we're delighted that uh, we're looking forward to her teaching a short course here um, at Grinnell in the spring. And of course, thank you to Eliza Willis, our own professor of political science, who will become the new chair for 2013. I'd like to thank all of you for your service. I'd also um, like to take this opportunity to introduce and welcome new members who are coming on board. Chris Hunter, Grinnell Professor of Sociology, Meg Jones-Bear, the Director of Donor Relations, Colleen Osborne, incoming SGA President and Grinnell Class of 2013, Christy Thnaus, the President and COO of the Community Foundation of Greater Des Moines, and Barry Thomas, Class of, 20, of 1997, Grinnell Trustee and Associate Professor and Faculty Director of the Strategic Innovation Academy at the University of Iowa. Again, thank you all for your time and talents. So now, for the introduction of the awards. We received 300 nominations from across the globe for this year's prize. The nominees were involved in an incredible array of social issues, from the environment and economic justice, to social entrepreneurship, business, the arts, refugee rights, immigration, education, fair housing, gay rights, restorative justice, and global peace. In a sense, the eventual winners of the prize stand for more than their own causes. They represent this entire global movement of people working to improve lives and meet urgent social needs. I'm now going to introduce you to this year's winners. The recipients will join us here in November for a week of lectures, discussion, and informal interactions. 
Um, the support that they receive uh, is split between the individual or the group who win and their organizations. Um, and uh, this allows them to pass the recognition forward to fellow innovators whom they think um, can be best suited to help advance uh, social justice through their organizations. So the first winner, Christy Hegranis, founder and executive director of Global Press Institute, was selected for the tremendous impact her organization has had by training and empowering women journalists in the developing world. Christy is age 31 and was moved to found the Institute in 2006 while reporting in Nepal. She realized that members of the local community could tell their own stories more effectively than a foreign reporter could. Beginning in Nepal and Mexico, Christy created an organization with two major goals. One, to empower women by leading them through uh, journalism training, including literacy and computer skills classes to employment. And two, to enable them to share their perspectives on injustices in their communities and use journalism to address large-scale structural social justice issues. Eventually, partnerships with other nonprofits helped GPI solidify its success and expand. Today, GPI has news desks in 25 countries and employs over 100 women. The GPI Newswire averages 20,000 readers per month, and through it, the women's stories are carried on UPI, Reuters, NPR, BBC, The Huffington Post, Women's E! News, and All Africa News, among many other outlets worldwide. Meanwhile, GPI coverage has led to real social change on topics ranging from civil rights in Nepal and Zimbabwe to maternal health in Mexico. The women producing these groundbreaking stories have not only developed their skills and found rewarding and stable careers, they are also gaining respect in their communities, improving their own lives and the lives of their families. Now we'll have a short uh, video um, introducing this winner. I went to Nepal to do the job that I always wanted to do. I always wanted to be a foreign correspondent and uh, to cover stories internationally. And while I was, you know, working my tail off and trying my best, um, I just, I realized I wasn't the right person to be telling the stories. Christy Hegrenes is a highly trained journalist studying at the prestigious Pointer Institute for Media Studies before getting her master's in journalism at New York University. I didn't speak the language. I didn't have the trust of the local people because I was an outsider. After spending time in Nepal trying to convince locals to open up and tell their stories, she realized that despite all her training, in the end, she was and always would be the outsider. And that would be a difficult obstacle to overcome. Which is why she decided to go to work with insiders. All of the indicators from World Health Organization and the, uh, the United Nations uh, tell us that when you invest in local women, they reinvest in their community. So that's really the first uh, agent of change for us is uh, employing and investing in these local women. Christy started recruiting women she could teach to become journalists to work for her new organization called the Global Press Institute, GPI. We want our stories to be different and better than every other story coming out of Nepal. So anyone who takes our training program and completes it for six months gets a job offer from GPI. We offer them long-term employment so that they can put the skills that they've just learned uh, to practical use. The training curriculum at GPI focuses on really traditional, rich, ethical investigative reporting. So it's not uh, it's not blogging, it's not, um, you know, more citizen journalism kind of style. It's really, um, really rich, traditional, ethical storytelling. And you guys alone can show the world a different side of Nepal, both good and bad. Christy looks for women who are willing to work hard, to learn, and most importantly, who have a desire to better themselves. One of her prize reporters is Tara Bhattarai. Myself, I like to write a story about women-related issues. Tara saw an advertisement for GPI back in 2007. The job offered an opportunity she and many other women in Nepal couldn't have dreamed existed. When I was a child, at that time, the, for the ladies, um, not allowed to go to school. Uh, 
so I struggled to go to school and I was also that time parentless. After working as a reporter for five years, Christy promoted Tara to editor of the GPI News Desk in Nepal. You know that our mission is to do three things for women around the world. Educate, employ, and empower them using journalism. So we strive for innovation in the stories that we tell. We want our stories to be different than any other media stories. These women, Tara in particular, um, in so many ways, I consider her almost like the co-founder of GPI, you know, because she um, she's demonstrated that it works. On this day, Tara's assignment is to interview a woman who was a victim of domestic violence and has been kicked out of the house by her husband. <laughs> the interview starts slowly. Tara does most of the talking, but as she continues her conversation, the woman gradually becomes more comfortable and is soon opening up about the hardship she has faced. After 90 minutes, Tara has enough for her article. As soon as she completes this story, she will move on to the next and the next focusing on women's issues that are overlooked in Nepal's media. GPI is uh, very important because um, this, uh, Nepal is a very poor country uh, and lot, lots of problems here. She walks through the streets a strong, confident woman. Nothing like the girl Christy first met. Someone like Tara who, you know, six years ago was a very different person in a very different place. And today, you know, she walks into a room and people want to shake her hand and she can get interviews in any government ministry and she's, she's powerful. You know, she's powerful and people read and recognize her stories and uh, so that's really great to watch. But everything that's in that frame, the viewer sees and sometimes something might be distracting. The women who are hired as reporters for GPI receive professional training. If they can produce good reports on important issues, it can mean worldwide exposure through syndication for themselves and GPI. When you take a photograph, the shutter of the camera opens and closes to let in light to make the photograph. As I told the women during the training, there are photographs that have changed history, that have changed the course of a war or changed um, a, civil, a civil rights or a social movement. But the focus at GPI is not just producing news content. After they go through this training and they understand the power they have it, it, with their words and now with their photographs, as one of the girls said last night, my stories are all around the world with this sense of pride. And you're talking to about um, women who often didn't have much of a voice before. And with their new voices, these young reporters are focused on giving others like them their own chance to be heard. I have to raise the voiceless people's voice. That I'm really happy because I have a tool, I have a skill to, to raise the issues of the voiceless people. You can sense the emotion in Yam Kondel's words. Her work as a reporter is important. In fact, she feels her reports on climate change and health issues in Nepal are the most important thing she has done in her entire life. I'm really, very happy to work with my team and then with the GPI team. I'm really, really, very happy. I don't have any word to express my happy, really. <laughs> <laughs> Each of the GPI reporters is equally impressed at the life-changing opportunity offered to them. I never uh, ever thought that um, I would become a journalist one day and my voices would uh, be global voice one day. It's amazing things. It's amazing. It's amazing. Offered to them by Christy Hegren. <laughs> We're now in 25 countries uh, in virtually every region of the world and uh, we employ more than 120 women. The opportunity means so much to these women and it's been really truly extraordinary uh, to watch them use this opportunity to not only change their own lives and their families' lives but literally the lives of millions of people. In the hands of women, journalism can be a change maker for the entire community.
Grinnell College proudly recognizes Christy Hegrinus, founder of the Global Press Institute, with the 2012 Grinnell Prize for her work in international journalism and women's economic empowerment. The prize honors young innovators and leaders while acknowledging the college's history of social change. Congratulations to founder Christy Hegrinus and the Global Press Institute. Thank you. Winner number two, Jacob Wood and William McNulty from Team Rubicon. Our next set of winners, winners, Jacob Wood and William McNulty, were jointly nominated for their work creating and running Team Rubicon, which is a veteran service and disaster response organization. Team Rubicon was created in 2010 in response to the earthquake in Haiti. Watching the news coverage of that human tragedy, Jake, an Iowa native, realized that the skills he accumulated in the Marines were well suited to disaster relief. After a few short days of fundraising and planning, Jake, along with his fellow Marine, William, and a few other friends and colleagues set off for Haiti. Upon their arrival, they realized that traditional aid organizations, although effective at relief work, were not well equipped for immediate post-disaster response when circumstances were most unstable and dangerous. Team Rubicon bridges the gap by deploying small, rapid response teams of veterans to help in the immediate aftermath of a disaster until the arrival of traditional aid organizations. But for Jake and William, it was not enough to create a highly effective disaster response team. They also wanted to help veterans, and Team Rubicon evolved accordingly. As they described the charge, Team Rubicon began as a disaster response organization that used veteran service, but involved, evolved to become a veteran service organization that uses disaster response. They recognized that many veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan struggle with the aftermath of physical injuries, with post-traumatic stress disorder, unemployment, and a loss of community and purpose. They designed Team Rubicon to recreate a positive sense of community and purpose by providing veterans with a way to continue their service. Today, their organization is growing and thriving. More than 350 Team Rubicon veteran volunteers have been deployed to disaster sites in Chile, Burma, Pakistan, Sudan, and across the United States. Jake and William have over 3,500 total veterans in their database, and their goal is to engage at least 10,000 in their mission of providing more effective disaster response while helping servicemen and women successfully transition back into civilian life. Now a short video about their organization and their work. On January 12, 2010, the nation of Haiti was devastated by a 7.0 earthquake. It is also the day that Team Rubicon was born and called into action. We reacted. We went. We didn't think about it because the problem was so grim. That's just one horrible thing after another. Uh, it was, it was very intense. This uh, disaster here is uh, horrible uh, injuries and uh, no supplies at the hospital. This is the biggest hospital in the Central Army in uh, Port-au-Prince, and there are no supplies. Everybody was expecting chaos. Everybody was expecting destruction. But we didn't know what the danger level would be. So let's get our gauzes, let's get our chlorhex, let's get our satchel full of silver sulfadiazine. After going to Katrina five years ago, I saw how bad the establishment was at, at responding rapidly. And so when I saw this hit Haiti, you know, I knew that the status quo was going to be this lumbering response. And I said, well, why can't I fix that? This is what, eight days after the quake? Yeah. Eight days, right? So eight days after the quake, you were first responders. There's no central government. There's no one handing out this type of aid at this point. These people are starving. So it's, it's really kind of a, it's really kind of a pandemonium out there. Team Rubicon doesn't cut through red tape. They arrive before the red tape. And it's just like a well-oiled machine from start to finish. We want to be able to deploy these autonomous teams into regions that have been struck and devastated and bridge that gap between when that devastation happens and when 
the large aid, aid organizations can respond. Team Rubicon is a nonprofit veteran service organization that repurposes the skills of military veterans and pairs them with medical professionals in the immediate aftermath of natural disasters. Team Rubicon's fast-moving, highly trained volunteer teams arrived after severe storms ripped through Dallas. Team Rubicon has recruited over 2,500 volunteers, deployed over 100 veterans in 10 disasters across the country. I'm glad y'all were safe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Appreciate it, sir. They were on the ground in Chile after the devastating earthquake. Over 500 people were killed and thousands were in need of medical help. Necesitas medicos? Team members had to travel through desolate and dangerous areas to find victims. Uh, just as they did after deadly flooding in Pakistan, an earthquake in Burma. Team Rubicon even entered a war zone in South Sudan to bring medical supplies and equipment to help open hospital clinics. Our purpose in being here is to use a healthcare bridge toward peace. Doing whatever is needed to help those who need it the most. Going wherever they can make a difference immediately. The whole idea of, of using small, fleet-footed, uh, eight to 10 man teams, very similar to what we were doing in, in the military, it just made a lot of sense. And we could insert these teams very quickly and, and treat the acutely injured with what we could carry in our backs. Team Rubicon is earning more and more respect around the world. One group of veterans even runs an organization called Team Rubicon. It's impossible to count the number of people saved by these emergency response volunteers but any list of those helped by Team Rubicon has to include the military veterans themselves. Being part of Team Rubicon has allowed me to find that focus again and move forward in, in a positive direction, continuing to help others. It's important for us to help our neighbors out when they're knocked down. It's just the right thing to do. I think a lot of people too, after we left the military, had a feeling that we wanted to do something that was, I guess, constructive rather than destructive. It's you know, a way to continue serving even though you're you know, no longer a part of the military um, just because you're out of uniform uh, and your contract ended with the military doesn't mean your service has to end uh, to your country. Grinnell College proudly recognizes Jacob Wood and William McNulty, co-founders of Team Rubicon, with the 2012 Grinnell Prize for their work to unite the skills and talents of military veterans with medical first response teams in disaster areas. The prize honors young innovators and leaders while acknowledging the college's history of social change. Congratulations to co-founders Jacob Wood and William McNulty and Team Rubicon. And finally, our third set of winners, Jane Chin and Linus Liang from Embrace. Jane and Linus were selected for their accomplishments with their organization, Embrace, which produces and distributes a low-cost infant incubator for use by families in developing countries. Founded in 2008, Embrace actually grew out of a class project. Jane and Linus were enrolled in a Stanford class entitled Entrepreneurial Experiences in Extreme Affordability. I don't think we have that class here, uh, but we may. Uh, and were assigned the task of designing an extremely low-cost incubator to be used in rural conditions across the globe. Not only did they meet the challenge, they decided to take their invention, an infant warmer, costing just about 1% of a traditional incubator, into the real world. Jane had a background in management, consulting, and business, and Linus had expertise in computer science and tech startups. So they able to, were able to draw on their complementary skills to found and lead the organization they had created. Their spirit of interdisciplinarity even extends to their business model. Jane and Linus recently co-founded a for-profit partner organization called Embrace Innovations, with Jane serving as a CEO. The for-profit arm enables them to raise venture capital to sustain their work so that they can continue providing infant warmers to parents in need and developing other affordable health projects for four products for poor communities. Currently, Embrace widely distributes their infant warmers in India, where they have already saved the lives of hundreds of premature babies. They've also begun distributing warmers in China and Somalia. Through their own work and their partnerships with healthcare providers, Linus and Jane developed a low-income community 
intervention and address the enormous problem of infant mortality and maternal health. Now the final video of the last winners of the prize of 2012. <laughs> My name is Linus Liang, and I help save babies' lives. Linus Liang is not bragging. He's simply stating a fact that he and the rest of the team at Embrace are indeed saving lives, and they are doing so thanks to an assignment they received in a Stanford classroom five years ago. And the challenge posed to us was to build a baby incubator that costs less than 1%, the cost of a traditional incubator, which is $20,000. Jane Chen is now CEO of Embrace Innovations, but she was just a Stanford business student when she took on this unusual assignment. 20 million low birth weight and premature babies are born every year around the world. Um, one of the biggest problems they face is staying warm. It's a big issue, and it's one issue that hasn't really made much progress in the last 20 years. But incubators are not only expensive, they require a constant supply of electricity, they're difficult to operate, so you're not going to find them in rural areas where many of these babies are dying. We decided to make a solution uh, just catered towards um, basically stabilizing a baby's temperature. We actually started with all these crazy ideas. We actually had hot water um, underneath the baby and you, you basically boil the hot water, you pour it underneath the baby, and then the idea was to warm up the baby and, and stabilize the temperature that way. Uh, but, you know, we realized that putting hot water in our baby is never a really good idea. The team went through many different ideas and designs before settling on an idea that proved to be a winner. So we developed the Embrace Infant Warmer, which looks like a little sleeping bag for the baby. It consists of a, a heating, an electric heater that we have um, that heats up a pouch. Uh, you can think of it as a plastic bag filled with this chemical. That chemical is a wax-like substance engineered to hold a constant temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, about the same as the human body temperature. With their product in place, the students made the decision to move their assignment to the next level, which meant moving to India, where 40 percent of all premature babies are born. It was there that they started manufacturing their product, and where they saw the Embrace Infant Warmer in use for the first time. They really attributed the health of the baby to Embrace. Um, and so we went into that village and they had told all the other villagers about the products and you know the grandmother was talking about it and it was just so rewarding to see that we uh, played a role in saving that baby's life. You can see that immediate result. You can see the baby's temperature stabilize. You can see them actually getting better and surviving and, um, and that's very, very rewarding. Embrace infant warmers have already been used on hundreds of premature and low weight babies in India. But the Embrace team members want this classroom assignment turned medical breakthrough to continue expanding around the world. China, um, Somalia, and pretty soon Afghanistan, Zambia, Uganda. So we're really trying to go global with this product. We really try to scale it out and get it to the, the people who really, really need it. So uh, what we want to do is probably affect the lives and impact the lives of hundreds of thousands of babies in the next couple years. Most students take their grade and move on to the next class. It's not an exaggeration to say hundreds of thousands of families around the world may someday be thankful this group of Stanford students did not stop working when their assignment was completed. Our hope is to create a whole line of affordable healthcare technologies for these communities. So the infant warmer is just the beginning of that vision. Grinnell College proudly recognizes Jane Chen and Linus Liang, co-founders of Embrace and Embrace Innovations, with the 2012 Grinnell Prize for work to improve maternal and child health. The prize honors young innovators and leaders while acknowledging the college's history of social change. Congratulations to co-founders Jane Chen and Linus Liang and Embrace and Embrace Innovations. I, I hope that you will agree with me that this is an extraordinary group of young people who are working to change the world in a positive way. Um, we look forward to them joining us uh, during the week of November 12th for the Grinnell Prize Symposium and Award Ceremony. During the symposium, you'll be able to meet the honorees and learn more about their work and their philosophies of social justice. Each of them will deliver a public lecture and participate in panel discussions and small group meetings with the Grinnell, Grinnell community. There will also be events held on campus between now and November to learn more about them and the prize. The college will also further opportunities for interaction over the coming year, 
and we'll keep you uh, in, uh, informed about these as they develop. I'm also delighted to announce that the keynote speaker at the 2012 symposium will be Jerry Greenfield, a co-founder of Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream, um, though obviously known for his ice cream. Uh, ben & Jerry's was also a founder of socially committed business movements dedicated to a sustainable corporate concept of linked prosperity and companies that seek to meet human needs and eliminate injustice. Uh, I urge you to come and hear Jerry. He's a great speaker and the parent of a recent Grinnell alum. Um, and I hope that you'll participate in the symposium, as many symposium events as you can. Uh, not that you need further incentives, but I also understand that Jerry also plans to give out free ice cream during his keynote, as he does at many of his speaking engagements. So, nominations for 2013. As we look forward to meeting our outstanding 2012 winners, we also are beginning the year-long process of seeking and reviewing nominations for the 2013 prize. I encourage you to nominate the young innovators for social justice who inspire you. It's a wonderful way to earn recognition for the cause you care about, causes that you care about, and to possibly help them win a significant monetary prize to support that work. I urge you to visit the Grinnell Prize webpage, uh, grinnell.edu slash social justice prize, and submit your nominations at any time starting today through November 5th. While you are there, please also volunteer to get involved in future prize efforts. We especially need students, faculty, and staff, and alumni to help uh, review nomination essays. So, before we leave, I want to take one more minute to appreciate our fellow Grinnellians who worked so hard to make this year's prize a great success. Join me in thanking the following people, Morgan Bauer, class of 12, Doug Cutchins, 93, Deanna Shorb, Grinnell Prize student workers, Corey Keeler, 12, and Rabin, uh, Sammy Rabine, 14, and Anna Bausack, 12, the faculty, staff, alumni, and student volunteers who reviewed nominations, the public relations firm of Cooper Katz, the Grinnell Communications Office, and the many other offices across campus that helped make the prize and today's announcement a success. I especially want to sing out Rachel Bly, 93, in the Conference Operations and Events Office. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, uh, Melissa, Chan, Melissa Chan and her assistant, Carolyn Saxton, for coordinating the prize program, and Sarah Purcell and her program, uh, Associate Lauren Van Wick, for the Rosenfield Program of Public Affairs, International Relations, and Human Rights, who organized the November Symposium. Again, thank you all for coming, and I look forward to seeing you at the prize events in November. <laughs>